our uh, task for today. I don't know if you can see this or not. This is drawn very lightly on here, but we're going to grind this 5 8 ml. And uh, kind of the reason we have to grind it is because of this custom sized chamfer on the tips, the 45 by, um, what is it, 95 and a half thousandths chamfer. So we're going to go over to the grinder and program and grind this tool. I've got the, um, the 5 8 blank in the collet chuck here and I stuck it out two inches. That's going to become important in just a little bit when we do the programming. And I got this indicator base on here and I was checking the run out a little bit here to jog the A axis. And uh, it's running out of maybe a couple of tenths, as you can see there. A little bit less than that, maybe. Um, over here, I can adjust this. I'll move the camera so you can see. Um, I made a video a, a while back about this, this collet chuck, that I, I made this collet chuck. And these uh, four adjusting screws around the perimeter, kind of like a, a set true chuck, maybe, if you will, or, or um, this, this um, collet chuck you know, body has, a, has kind of a flexure in it and I've machined a groove up in here that's very thin right here so when I adjust these screws it actually flexes the body enough to get an adjustment because I'm, I'm looking at a very extremely small amount of run out to adjust and this this base thing here I made it the other day because if you saw in my previous video I was making some five flute tools that have a irregular flute spacing so you really can't just mic straight across them even if I don't have a five flute mic but even if I did with this flute spacing not being exactly 72 degrees on the five flute tool it really won't give you an accurate measurement on the diameter so I made this base to hold this um, this digital indicator which as you can see resolves to a well this is a, a tenth of a thousandth so so this a it only changes um, half of that here on this dial, but that's that's good enough. And I can put this on the um, I can set a preset to it, which I've set to the half the diameter of this uh, blank right now. And I and then I can uh, measure quite precisely. Now, it is possible if if I look over this direction, let me jog the the B axis. It is possible to measure with this probe and, and to measure the diameter but for some reason in the cycle of grinding a new tool they don't have the measuring cycle and, and you'd have to run two concurrent uh, files or programs I guess you might say to um, a regrind in a regrind setup you can measure the diameter but for some reason the probing cycle isn't available to you if you're making a brand new tool or or maybe it is and I just don't know how to um, if you hear that, that's the horizontal mill in the background. If I don't know if that's if you can hear that or not, is the reason that noise in the background. It's machining on the ink and L segments. But to go back to this, so it is possible to measure diameters with this probe, as well as many other things. But it's kind of a it's kind of like you got to go back and forth with programs and and everything, and, and it's just easier for me to do this and. And I get a real, you know, with this indicator base, I get a real good visual, um, you know, of what the diameter actually is. And I can jog the tool back and forth on the flute to get the actual high spot, which using the, the, um, the touch probe over there, theoretically it would be on the actual high spot of the flute, but I'm not really 100% confident with that, so I, I prefer this method or to mic it with some mics, but if you have an irregular spaced fluting, flutes on the tool or, or a, an odd number of flutes that you don't have a mic for, like seven flutes or nine flutes or something, this is about the only way to do it. So this thing, I can move it back and forth and um, take it in and out of here just like this. So we've got our, our blank in here, 
and like I say, it's sticking out two inches long, and the cut length is only going to be about an inch long on this end mill, but you have to stick it out a little further because the grinding wheel, when fluting, is going to come up here and it's going to hit your collet um, if you have it too close. Um, and this is what ends up happening. Ask me how I know that happens. You hit it with the grinding wheel, and this can, uh, these diamond wheels, this can actually damage the wheel to some degree. You see how hot it got here on this blue spot on the collet? And you don't want to do that if you can help it. The screen on the control of the machine part of the thing. And if we click up here to, on Numroto, this is the software. It's kind of like a cam software inside of the machine, if you will. And this software is made by a company called Noom, and they call it Noom Roto for grinding rotary tools, is the reason it's called that. So this is what's used on this machine. Now, if we're going to grind a new tool, it's really pretty easy to program a, a standard tool like this, or more or less, more or less standard tool like this, because it's just a, a regular end mill with a chamfer on it, and they have a cycle for that. So we first select um, this here, and we, we've got, now I guess there can be many more uh, modules to this software that I don't have here. I only have to grind end mills, form tools, which can be an end mill or any kind of a, um, like you see in the picture there, a form tool of some sort, almost any shape you can imagine, and any kind of flute spacing, any kind of helix angle, anything. The end mills themselves are a little bit more restrictive than this. You could grind an end mill with this form tool cycle, but you have a lot more freedom of, of um, you could have different helix angles on every tooth of the tool, and as well as spacing and everything else. You really can't quite do that with the end mill part. You can do some of that, but not as much as with the form tool um, part of this software. And this is just for drills and pretty self-explanatory drills, step drills, things like that. And you have different kinds of styles, and, and this is for grinding burrs. I, I never have ground a burr, so I've never used that part of the software. But we're going to select end mill here, and we're going to select new. And this is going to be a, a cylindrical end mill. Select it's cylindrical. You can have taper or cylindrical. And we want to chamfer on the tool. And it's actually going to be center cutting in this case. You could either have center or non-center cutting, as you see here. And so we, we say manufacturing. You could either select resharpening or manufacturing. Um, there's a little bit of difference between resharpening. Like I said earlier, you have the probing cycle to probe the tool. To, so you, you, you would program the, the general shape of the tool that you best know, if you will and then the machine will probe it and it'll update certain factors of the tool like the helix angle and the flute spacing if you, if you ask it to probe those things and, it, and the diameter as well and it'll uh, kind of update your definition of the tool but we're not going to worry about that we're going to do just straight manufacturing of this tool and now the cut length here it's asking me it's one inch according to their drawing they made for me External diameter is 0.625. Uh, uh, it's actually going to be slightly less. Let, let me actually make that 0.624 probably because the blank, you're not going to get a pure 0.625 end mill out of a, a 5 eighths blank because it's already under that size. Being centerless ground, they're usually about two to three ten thousandths under that nominal size. Core diameter, I usually start with half the diameter of the tool to start with on this. You can adjust this later, of course. You can adjust all of this later. I'm just getting a general description. I don't want any taper to this tool, so there's going to be no taper. And this is going to be the dish angle of the end of the tool, which typically an end mill has, um, you could see the little icon, well, maybe you can't see it. Let me drag it over here. Typically, an end mill has a you know, this dish angle on the end, so it's actually um, longer on the, on the outside of the flutes than the inside, it's cut length, so it gives you clearance, so it cuts 
sort of like a face mill or something on the tip of the tool, if you will. And um, the normal angle for most end mills is one to one and a half degrees. I'm gonna leave that at one degree. And the, the rotation, this is the um, rotation angle of the start of the flutes, as, as you can see by this little icon here. And we're just, we're not worried about this making a new end mill, so we're going to leave it at zero. And the chamfer length is 0.0955, as we saw from the sketch, and it's 45 degree angle. I'm going to go next here on this, and then we're going to select the number of, um, let me get a little closer here on this so you can kind of see it maybe better. We're going to select the number of flutes. So we're going to make a four flute tool in this case. You can see over here it's kind of building the flutes. And two of the flutes are going to be center cutting. The right hand uh, cut, so you go right or left. You can put either normal reliefs, which is what we're going to do, or you can have radial reliefs. Um, radial reliefs is kind of like you've seen some tools that have, they don't have separate relief angles like a primary and a secondary relief it's kind of a radius on the relief and you can do both kinds of uh, reliefs but on this tool we're going to just do normal reliefs which looks like this if, if it's just you know like you're, you're probably used to seeing on most end mills so that's going to be that what I say constant lead we're going to do a 30 degree lead angle and this is the lead it's come up with. It calculates it based on the angle entered here for the, um, per inch. So that's all we need there. We're going to go next and uh, we could identify the material if we wanted here. Our blank is a 5 8 blank. And this, this isn't really that critical, but the, the actual blank length, I think, was four inches. But it, this doesn't really matter for our purposes here, unless you want to display the tool in some fashion. So then we're just going to say next here. And um, the clamping length, which over here on this icon, you can see what it's asking for. The clamping length was two inches we saw earlier, and I happen to know that on my collet chuck it's 5.8 inches to the end of the collet, which is what it's asking here, and I'm going to give it some diameter of, say, 0.75 for the collet's diameter, so we get an um, indication here, and this will help for simulation if you're colliding with the collet, is all, you know, is all this really means. And the start angle, again, is zero degrees. This, this here is where it would probe the, the tool. It has to, of course, if you're probing it to re-grind it or anything, but we're not going to even be probing it that way, so it doesn't matter. We're just going to be probing the length of the, of the blank when we probe it is all, because we're making a new end mill. We go finished here. I'm kind of messing with a new camera and the autofocus was going crazy with this, and so I had to change settings a little bit here. I was going to show you what I did I, you have to select the wheels in here, so uh, for a fluting wheel, I was going to select this wheel. If you show the wheel, you can show the wheel package here, which this wheel package is going to have three wheels on it, actually, or what they call a wheel pack. And it's going to have a, uh, the fluting wheel, which is the one, kind of the light-colored one right here that I'm selecting right now. And then we got the cup wheel on the end and a gashing wheel inside, closer to the spindle face. So this is the wheel that I'm selecting for the fluting here. This, that's what I selected. And then the gashing wheel, like you saw, for the gash. And the cup wheel. Basically, the cup wheel is used for everything from here on, for all the clearance angles, the same cup wheel. So these three wheels can grind the complete end mill, and they're all on the same arbor that you'll see in a little bit in the video. I had to kind of re-film re, um, this because the, the autofocus on this camera, this new camera I have, you can set it certain ways and 
and the screen is apparently um, messing it up. It gets this moray pattern and it kind of oscillates around and stuff. And I'm not quite used to it yet. So that would be the, um, the wheel selection. And then over here, you have to select the coolant. If there's no coolant um, nozzle selected, you get this little icon right here. So you have to select the coolant nozzles you want to use for each wheel. I just turn them all on. You could turn specific ones on that only point towards that wheel, I guess, but I just run them all. I don't worry about it. And um, these areas here, you can select and you can adjust the feed rates. Uh, I'm, I'm actually filming this after I already ground the end mill, so I already adjusted these in the uh, program earlier and ground the tool already, but these are the selections you have here to do this kind of stuff. There's a lot more selections in the software itself too that I really didn't show. I was editing the video clips here and, and um, as far as uh, what you can do, like over here you can, you can insert any kind of uh, all these different kinds of cycles, like here a, a body clearance cycle, on there you can have different chamfers you can cut off this cuts off the end of the tool if you want to cut off the end of the like like if you're regrinding a tool and you just want to cut it off or grind off the end of it manual flute you can add a, uh, another fluting operation this is kind of for um manual grinding path and you can do a lot with this you can do a whole lot of things with this and a uh, step face and then you can add more relief angles. You can add a plunge in feed cut, which is kind of like if you have different diameters in your tool, you can rough down the, the blank before the diameters of relief. Uh, another more reliefs if you want them. A rough profile like a roughing end mill has. You can grind those uh, like a corn cob roughing end mill, I guess, if you will, in there. You can have a a grinding cycle that kind of grinds off the back of the fluid. This is this you might use on a two fluid end mill because you got too much material in here between the flutes even after fluting it. You can have a tip clearance like on a ball end mill here where you would kind of, you've probably seen this on ball end mills. And you can uh, have another gash cycle depending on what you want, a notch between the gashes and different kinds of tip, more tip relief. So this shows the program shape of the blank, but I, I'm going to back up here a little bit and I'm going to select a cylindrical shape with, we're going to call it about 25 thousandths of stock on the end and nothing on the OD because the blank is the actual size of the tool. So then we're going to go back and look at this again. You can see now it's got a um, more like what we're dealing with here. And we're just going to run through this simulation real fast and see what we have. See actually without making any adjustments to anything that looks that doesn't look too bad. So we're, we're all right. The only thing I like to look at sometimes here is the uh, is run a 2D simulation and make sure my clearance is if, if we zoom in on this you can kind of see them highlighted here, but that I'm inside the diameter here of the tool, so I'm not rubbing the back of the flute. So that looks pretty good. So now we got to mount the um, grinding wheel. We got to change because I don't have the correct wheel in the spindle here of the machine. And we just grind this tool. That's really all there is to it. Um, if this chamfer angle was real, well, we could look at, at the load on the spindle. I didn't do that. Down here at the bottom of this graph, if I, if I back up in here a little bit, down in this area, it's going to show me, it's going to actually show me the load on the wheels. You'll see, you'll see curves here. You can see how, how the fluting wheel is putting quite a bit of load or volume it's taking off compared to these other ones and and also these so I'm gonna to try to even this out a little bit here I'm gonna slow down 
this feed rate to, um, let's say, two inches a minute here. And also on these, on these re reliefs and stuff, I don't like to feed that fast. So I'm going to feed it three on this one and, and one and a half on my... You can do it that fast, but it leaves a... It leaves a... Um, on the, particularly on the primary relief, the tool will grind faster. You know, you'll make the tool for manufacturing purposes. That would probably be fine, but, and then a lot of end mill producers use those higher feed rates. In fact, I can simulate a cut, uh, a grinding time that says 14 minutes. Now I could push that back to those high feed rates and grind this tool in probably five or seven minutes, but, um, it leaves a kind of a, a rough cutting edge, and I like to have a smoother cutting edge on the flute, at least on the, on the primary clearances, so I back them down to a much slower feed rate. So let's, uh, let's look at the simulation again, and we're gonna see down here our curve on how much load, theoretically this is kind of like how much volume or load is being put on the, on the particular grinding process. And, uh, If I click on here, it'll actually put the wheel in that location, if you can see it there, where it is actually. This doesn't look too bad. You might be able to get away with this. I can always override the feed rate manually on the machine here if I see that the spindle load is too high. You don't want to get too much load because it generates heat and it can damage the carbide or, or the wheel if you, if you get too carried away there. So this looks like a good starting point. So we'll put the grinding wheel pack that I need on the spindle and we'll grind the tool. The, the grinding wheel pack, I don't want this one, but it's a very similar grinding wheel pack. It's just that it has an angle to the fluting wheel that I don't want. The, the fluting wheel I want has a square angle to it. But other than that, it's almost the same kind of a, a pack. And I'm going to uh, take this manifold off of here because we don't want that one. We want this to put the coolant or oil, if you will, in the correct places for those wheels. And that's, that's really all we have to do, really, for the moment. I'm going to come back over here to the computer. We're going to go back to the Numroto software. We're going to go manufacturing here, and we're just going to probe the clamping length of the, of the blank, and we're going to leave about 25 thousandths on the length so that we clean up for sure on the on the cutting the end of the tool. Although we could we can always regrind this a little bit to push it back if necessary, but that should be enough. We say manufacturing. It's making the program here. I don't know if you can see this way over here. It's it's uh there's a little icon, it's transferring the data to the control of the machine from this software. So it says it's ready, so we can push start here anytime we want to. I'm going to go back to this page, which is the machine, and display the wheel compensation over here. That's something I didn't check. We got. I'm only really worried about the the cup wheel. That that finishes the size of the tool, and it's on offset number one according to this. So I'm going to say one is at zero right now. Now. Oddly enough, with this grinding operation, and I, I put a sticker up here, negative offset goes bigger and positive goes smaller on these uh, grinding wheel offsets. So when you're running other machines, it's just the opposite of that. So you gotta be kind of careful, but starting out at zero should be fine. We'll probably be at a positive number on this offset to get the actual size. So, so let's see if I can, um, I'm gonna turn the coolant off here so I can have the door open and let's see if we can watch the probing cycle here, if I can get this to do it.
If I push start. See it's coming over here and it's just it's just probing the, the length of the tool right there. And now I'm now I gotta close the door. I'm gonna be able to really see too much here. I'm gonna start it and you're gonna see it's gonna go for the fluting first, but oop, gotta turn the coolant on. Me, let me uh don't want to run it without coolant. Let me turn the coolant on and start again here. Just the fluting by itself. See, there's no tip on the tool yet. Let me move this around a little bit. You can see there's no, there's no tip or anything. We just fluted the flutes. So the next thing's gonna be to gash these, this tip out here. And then uh, we're gonna start grinding the cutting edges. This is the gash out like we saw in the graphics, just the tip of the end mill. That's what's known as the gash in an end mill. This is what it looks like. So now we got to come in and grind first the OD clearance angles and then the, the tip clearance angles here and then the chamfer on the tool. There's the gash on the tip of the tool. You might notice this, this relief angle looks a little bit wide here. Sometimes you don't get exactly perfectly what the graphics show, but it'll still work fine. If I was making a lot of these, I'd probably uh, adjust that. But I'm only making one tool, so I'm just going to let it go like that. It'll cut fine. It just doesn't look exactly perfect, but 